to your point about being in the sandwich generation, there are so many people in our country who are right in the middle. They're taking care of their kids and they're taking care of their aging parents. Mm -hmm. And it's just almost impossible to do it all, especially if they work. We're finding that so many are then having to leave their job, which means losing a source of income. Yeah. Not to mention the emotional stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what I am proposing is that basically what we will do is allow Medicare to cover in-home health care. Oh. Fine. Because we're talking about these kinds of things where it's just about helping an aging parent or person, um, you know, prepare a meal, um, you know, put their sweater on. Yes. And it's about dignity for that individual. It's about independence yeah. for that individual. Oh, yes. I mean, what, people are of declining skills to some extent, but their dignity has their pride has not declined no. they want to they want to stay in their home they don't want to go somewhere else plus for the family to send them to a residential care facility to hire somebody is yeah. so expensive oh, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll just say well but here's the other thing about it so, you know people say well how are you gonna pay for it here yeah. here's the thing here's how we pay for it part of what I also intend to do is allow Medicare to continue to negotiate drug prices against these big pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. yes. which means we are gonna save Medicare the money because we're not gonna be paying these high prices right. and that those resources are best then put in a way that helps a family like the one you are describing which, mm -hmm. which you have already done which we insulin. have already right. done yeah. with yeah. insulin yeah. So can we do And that right there is what I have been waiting for from Kamala Harris. She should be supporting Medicare for all, to be clear. But in the absence of that, she needs to talk about specific things that she would do to improve our broken healthcare system. And we really haven't seen much of that from her up until now. And it's frustrating because she's not even running on a public option, which is something that even Joe Biden pretended to support when he was running for president. But I think that this right here is a realistic incremental improvement that builds on Medicare that would meaningfully fully improve the lives of so many people and I'm all for it. And just to put things into perspective for you, this is the annual cost of long-term care for seniors compared to the median income for Medicare beneficiaries. Now, as you can see, assisted living facilities and nursing homes are nearly double and triple their income respectively. And one of the more popular options, which is around the clock at home care, is by far and away the most expensive option at 290K a year, which nobody can afford unless you're rich. And if Kamala can get this done, it would be life changing because as Axios reports, about 47% of US adults in their 40s and 50s, which she'd referred to by the way as the sandwich generation, are juggling caring for both elderly parents and young children. And 70% of seniors are projected to need long-term care they can't afford. So this would ameliorate one of the biggest healthcare crises in the country if she's able to get this done. And yes, even though I am still disappointed that she chose to run away from Medicare for all, continue to build upon Medicare and improve it until we can one day expand it to everyone and have Medicare for all is important. These small steps towards that goal, they matter, even if they're small. But I mean, this policy isn't small. It would make a huge difference in the lives of millions of Americans. So I'm all for it. I think she explained it well, and the proposal itself was absolutely genius. Now, that was one of the highlights from her interview spree. And I say interview spree because her and Tim Walls have been on a media blitz lately. And I want to talk about some highlights and some lowlights. So she also went on the Howard Stern show. She went on the Call Her Daddy podcast. And for the most part, it was was a very surface level interview where her answers were fine, but there wasn't really any hard questions. Conservatives are pretending like it was a disastrous interview because if you go to the YouTube channel, there's more dislikes than likes, but that's not an indication that the audience of Call Your Daddy is revolting or reacting negatively to Harris. It's just an indication that you all brigaded the video and dislike bombed it. That means nothing. But I mean, it was a very low stakes interview and I think she did fine. She also appeared on 60 Minutes in addition to The View. And 
the 60 Minutes one was certainly a little bit more mixed. I mean, Trump didn't even bother to show up, which was a bad look for him because they talked about that. And also Harris was skewered for changing positions on fracking and immigration. And I think that they were right to criticize her for that because she has changed her positions for the worse, by the way. Now, when it comes to uh, Israel-Palestine on 60 Minutes, she trotted out the same scripted line she's been using since the DNC. And it still sounds bad. It's still terrible. And she should stop saying that. She should say something else. And in particular, she should change policy. But more on that later. Now, there was a moment where she was being asked on the 60 Minutes interview about her being a gun owner. And the interviewer asked her what kind of a gun she had owned. And uh, she said she had a Glock and then laughed awkwardly. And it came off as pandering to me. Uh, but... I understand why, as a Democrat, she needs to reinforce this idea that Democrats aren't some boogeyman who are going to take away your guns. So I get why she did it, but it felt awkward and cringe to me, just being honest. Now, there was a moment from her 60 Minutes interview that I want to play for you where she was just downright bad. She gave a terrible answer to a question that shouldn't have been asked in the first place. But so... This is a portion from the online interview that she did that wasn't aired on the main show, but she was asked who the United States' biggest adversary was, and um, this was her response. I think there's a, an obvious um, one in mind, which is Iran. Iran has American blood on their hands. Believe it or not, it does get worse as she keeps talking. Uh, she went on to condemn the 200 ballistic missiles that Iran fired at Israel while saying nothing about the escalation from Israel that led to that point. She then goes on to say that one of her highest priorities as president is to make sure that Iran never becomes a nuclear power while not saying anything about whether or not she would re-enter the JCPOA that the Obama administration negotiated. And it boggles my mind why Democrats chose to run away from that policy, right? The International Atomic Energy Agency verified that Iran was in compliance multiple times. The deal was working, but yet Trump chose to get us out of that deal, and Biden has chosen to not get us back into that deal for some reason, even though his predecessor negotiated it, and it was a huge accomplishment, and he's chosen to not get back into that deal, even though Iran has expressed openness to renegotiate when they have no reason to do that, since we've proven that we're not really a good faith actor here, and we're willing to just renege on agreements that we made at any time. Now, I have hope that Maybe it would be something that's on the table for Harris, even though she's not saying that since her foreign policy advisor is Phil Gordon, who helped Obama get that deal done. But her naming Iran as our greatest adversary is a very bad decision because it could embolden Netanyahu to escalate even more. And this could come back to bite her if he does do that. If he sees, oh, OK, so Harris hates Iran, too. Well, maybe I'll, uh, I'll go a little bit more further to antagonize them and maybe I'll bomb their nuclear sites, which is what Trump is encouraging them to do. It's just a terrible answer. But I do want to get back to her interview on The View because it was mostly good. The subject of DeSantis came up. And if you haven't been following along, DeSantis refused Harris's call when she reached out regarding the hurricane, which is a very petty partisan move. But Harris was asked about that on The View. And here's how she responded. Now, he said this morning, you've never called regarding any of the storms Florida has had since you've been vice president until apparently now and called it political. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, I have called and talked with in the course of this crisis, this most recent crisis, Democrat and Republican governors called, taken the call, answered the call, had a conversation. So obviously, this is not an issue that is about partisanship or politics for certain leaders, but maybe is for others. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that that is a perfectly fine answer. I take no qualms with anything that she said. DeSantis is purposefully playing politics at the worst possible time. That's obvious to everybody. And I am no fan of bipartisanship. You all know that. But if ever there was a time to put aside partisan politics for the greater good, don't you think that dealing with a hurricane might be a pretty good time to do that. It just makes no sense why right now you would choose to try to get a one-up on Harris by not taking her call. When Harris called you 
to be the bigger person, to be a grown up, to try to work together to help the people of Florida. Now, you can argue that she was also playing politics by making that call, but who cares? I don't care what the intent is so long as the outcome is good. So I have no critiques of Harris's reaction. I do, however, take issue with Biden's baffling response where he chose to be complimentary towards DeSantis to the point where he ended up publicly undermining Harris. The governor of Florida has been cooperative. He said he's gotten all that he needs. I talked to him again yesterday, and I and I said, whatever. You, I said, no, you're doing a great job. It's being all being done well. We thank you for it. And I literally gave my personal phone number to call. Um, so I don't know. There was a rough start in some places, but every governor, every governor from Florida to North Carolina, has been fully cooperative and supportive and acknowledged what this team is doing and they're doing an incredible job but we got a lot more to do joe biden is genuinely an imbecile harris is saying that desantis isn't being cooperative because he's not and then biden undermines her publicly by saying no actually he is being cooperative and now guess what's happening right wingers are circulating that clip and they're showing how biden is contradicting harris and now it makes it seem like Harris is the one playing politics when DeSantis is the one playing politics in actuality, all because of Joe Biden. So uh, good job, Joe. Way to undermine your own vice president. But on the subject of Biden, Harris was asked if she would have done anything differently than Joe Biden in the past four years. And her answer was uh, not good. Would you have done something differently than President Biden during the past four years? There is not a thing that comes to mind in terms of, and I've been a part of, of, of most of the decisions that have had impact. Yeah. So we're going to come back to this because she eventually does give an answer, but you heard her say it. There's nothing she could think of that she would do differently. Can't think of anything, really? Letting Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema run roughshod and humiliate him? Letting the COVID era policies expire? I don't know. Arming and funding a genocide, that's a pretty big one. I don't understand why she's doing this. Joe Biden is a deeply unpopular lame duck president, and her willingness to tether herself to him, to attach herself to the sinking political ship, feels like political suicide to me. It makes no sense. And that's not just me saying this. This is the same conclusion that her own campaign came to because CNN reports in mid-September, the Democratic Research and Polling Initiative Blueprint conducted a national poll testing a long series of potential statements Harris could make about herself and Biden. Those that performed best, the polling found, were those that displayed a clear break between her and Biden, while those that performed worst were those that portrayed a future Harris administration as building on the accomplishments of the Biden era. Any mention of Biden, the polling found, led to less support, even if the position it had Harris taking was the same. Those numbers have made their way around Harris aides. Harris wants to create space between her and Biden, top aides say, but not too much space. She wants to be loyal, but she also wants to win. She is still planning to lean on Biden, who is flying to Milwaukee on Tuesday for an event trumpeting more projects made possible by administration efforts to buck up union members or to park himself in battleground Pennsylvania for political stops in the final weeks. But no one on the vice president's team is upset that Biden is headed to spend a whole week of October overseas on a non-pressing diplomatic trip to Germany and Angola. Some wish he'd go away for longer. Part of leading Democrats' focus on Biden is seeing him as the albatross embodiment for the unsettling feeling spreading among Democrats that the vice president is not, or at least not yet, where she needs to be to win in just over four weeks. So her team is well aware of the fact that Harris gets more popular when she distances herself from Biden. So the question is, why won't she do that more often? I mean, to her credit, she has done that in some way. She said that she supports marijuana legalization, which is a break from Biden. But it happened. And guess what? The sky didn't fall. So when Sonny Hostin gave her another opportunity to distance herself from Biden on a key issue like Gaza, for example, why didn't she do it? Well, even though polls show that most Americans do want to stop sending weapons to Israel, she refuses to break from Biden to her own detriment. And according to that CNN article, it's because she is in the situation room with Biden. So if she were to break from him on this issue, it wouldn't seem authentic.
That's the reasoning that they gave. I don't know how true it is, but I mean, changing your position on fracking and Medicare for all while claiming you've been perfectly consistent doesn't necessarily scream authenticity as well, but here we are. So why wouldn't you change your position on the most important issue, the issue that is hurting you the most because you refuse to break from Biden? It makes no sense, but I mean, she's made her decision and I don't think she's gonna break from Biden a couple of weeks before the election, and she's chosen to disregard the lessons, I guess, that Humphrey learned the hard way back in 1968 when he waited too long to distance himself from LBJ's deeply unpopular Vietnam War. But the good news is that she actually did come up with one way that she'd be different than Biden. The bad news is that she'd be worse than Biden on this particular issue where they'd be different. Let's watch. Yeah. By part, listen, I plan on having a Republican in my cabinet. You oh, asked I got me. a list. Yeah, right. You, you asked me what's the difference between Joe Biden and me. Well, that will be one of the differences. I'm going to have a Republican nice. in my cabinet because I don't, I don't feel burdened by letting pride get in the way of a good idea. Yeah, yeah. right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, goody, because we all know that Republicans are just bursting with good ideas like uh, war with Iran and cutting Social Security. Awesome. Great answer, Kamala. Who's going to be persuaded by this? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, obviously, she's saying this because she wants to appeal to moderates to create a contrast between her and Trump's extremism. But she hasn't realized that this is an election that is not about persuasion. It's about mobilization, as Sam Cedar puts it. She's not going to win by persuading moderate Republicans to vote for her. So these insane rallies that she's holding with Liz Cheney where she praises her war criminal father that's not going to win over many people and she risks alienating even more people by doing shit like this. The way she wins is by galvanizing her own base and policies like expanding Medicare to include long-term care is a great start. We need to see more of that, even though it doesn't directly affect young people who she needs to excite. It's still a great policy that I think they would be excited to come out and vote for. But one thing that young people do care about is Gaza. That is a genocide. And they want it to stop. And her stance on it has been demonstrably harmful to her campaign, and it's creating real disillusionment with her own base. That's not to say that I think she's going to lose because of it, but when the election is this close and Trump is the alternative, you can't afford to play it safe. You need to be bold and make it clear that you are a change candidate and an agent of change that is positive, not negative change. But I don't want to give you the impression that her interviews have been bad, because for the most part, I think that they've been fine. I think that they are going to help her overall despite the negatives because a lot of people are still trying to just figure out who she is and by her talking and allowing americans to get to know her i think it's a net positive so i'm glad that the campaign is finally doing more interviews but from my perspective as a leftist the energy and enthusiasm for her was palpable when biden dropped out because there was hope that she would be a little bit better than biden and uh you know since she's gone full neocon and ran to the right on issues like fracking and immigration, you kind of notice that a lot of the enthusiasm that she initially had has evaporated. She took the wind out of her own sails for no reason. But I mean, to be fair, this election still shouldn't be close, regardless of how bad of a campaign she's running, given that Trump is the alternative. And I've got to say, it's genuinely frustrating to see her make so many unforced errors. But I do think on the flip side, so long as she continues to keep proposing game changing policies like the one that she talked about on The View that we discussed at the start of this video, I do think that there's a lot of potential for her to reignite some of the enthusiasm for her campaign that she lost after her DNC speech. But we'll just have to wait and see. Either way, you know, this was a mixed bag. I don't necessarily think all of these, all of these interviews are going to hurt her despite my criticisms. Uh, so I do want to see more. I just would like as a leftist for once to not feel depressed about the candidate that the DNC has put forward. But, you know, here we are. Being a leftist means you're going to be perpetually disappointed. But nonetheless, that's what we've got. So um, that's my thoughts on it. I'm curious to know what you all think down below if you watch the interviews. Thank you.